Thanks, Danielle. Um, I, I'm going to resist the urge to go down the path of um, telling you how wonderful video games are and focus today on gamification. Um, it, it is a term you've probably heard, if not recently, in the last couple of years, but I'll take the time to define it. Um, it's, it's when we borrow from um, video games or, or non-digital games and we take the, the amazing job they do of motivating and engaging people and we take elements and apply it in a non-game setting. Um, so I'm distinguishing between um, video games themselves and where we end up in a non-game setting but taking game elements. But I, I think part of the reason gamification has become so popular is because of the rise of popularity in video games. So um, there'll be a memory test at the end on this and you'll need to know all the figures. But um, the, the key points I want to pull out are the, the average age of gamers is now up over 30. Um, there's an equal gender split in gaming. So it's a, it's a very popular thing. What I'm talking about today, though, is not gaming per se, so much as borrowing these elements. But I think a large part of the reason that gamification is enjoying the popularity that it is, is because this literacy with games is um, so widespread. So when you apply gamification, you're really um, taking from a, a very well-known and an increasingly well-known kind of um, language. Um, so. This, this is uh, stolen from Google Analytics, just showing the massive increase in interest in gamification. But, um, and here also we see um, the Gartner Group talking about um, how much gamification will creep into business. But then we also see from them um, another figure. And this is really what I'm here to talk to you about today, which is that gamification is not a panacea. It's not something you can slap on to your existing app or website and see success. And that seems to be the mistake that's commonly being made. Um, so what we're doing in our work, and I have to say, in the spirit of confession, when gamification first arose, I was a bit of a cranky old academic about it and said, we've been doing that for years. It's a silly term. It's not useful. I've come back from that. I think it's a useful term. I think we can make use of it. But the reason it's working is because it's drawing on established knowledge. And what we're trying to work out is how to maximise that leveraging of established knowledge to make gamification as effective and as powerful um, as possible. So. Uh, I just want to further define it a little bit for you. We can see sort of, um, and I'm borrowing from a number of excellent researchers in doing this, but, but I'm going to distinguish between basic gamification and more complex gamification. So basic gamification is, and I'm not suggesting yet that one is better than the other, although we may get there, but basic gamification is when we talk about things like badges and achievements and points, um, leaderboards, um, leveling, and lots of feedback and progress. Um, and, and that stuff can be used well. And then the more complex gamification is where we explore, and these are words that have come up in many of the speakers' talks today, and I don't think that's coincidence at all. Um, but when you get a true sense of play, letting the, the user um, fail in the boundaries of what you're building and explore what does and doesn't make sense within the environment, then, then you're going to get a, a more complex kind of gamification. If, if when you build in true exposition, um, integrate, the gamification into the real world setting, um, let the user create their own stories with it. When you provide good information and you sort of, you're not just telling a user, okay, um, here's a badge for doing the thing I told you to do, you're, you're giving them a sense of why they did that thing and what the value of that thing is and you build that information into the gamification and in the same sense when you build in a sense of reflection so that the, the user is um, not only engaged with what you've gamified but in, in connecting that to their real life, thinking about how it relates to their story or the, the things that they're seeing. The emerging research, and, and certainly our own work supports this, is that Basic gamification is probably really useful for short-term engagement, and complex gamification is a lot more useful in long-term engagement. I don't think that suggests that you couldn't use basic gamification effectively, but you might need to think more carefully about that. So a couple of quick examples um, of this in action. Um, this is uh, Nissan's um, electronic car. And you know, you'd be forgiven for thinking that elements of it are, in fact, a a video game, and they deliberately um, chased that aesthetic when you look at their design process. But they're using things like constant feedback to the user, um, giving them achievements when they hit certain um, environmental goals. Um, they give them an online profile so they can compete with other 
um, drivers of the car. The gear shift, in fact, is shaped like a joystick, which I'm surprised that they got through, but nonetheless. Um, and the whole HUD, uh, the whole heads-up display is, in fact, designed like a, a racing game. And I'm resisting the urge to tell you any figures about how effective this was, because I'm not sure I trust them, but they report that it was hugely successful in what they do. Um, another one you may well have seen, Nike's Fuel Band. Um, so this was, um, pro oh, this is probably the most cited example, but they've done a whole bunch of things um, to sort of engage their users and motivate them around badges, um, giving them really gamified feedback, setting daily goals for the user to achieve, um, animated characters that appear when you're doing particularly well, the option to challenge friends. Um, I will not resist this time to repeat the figure that they purport for this. They, they claim that they got a 40% increase in market share in three years. I can't find out where they get that number from, so I'm just telling you that's what they say. And I'm sure that would be limited to the um, quantified self corner of the market, not the market as a whole. But nonetheless, you see um, big success. A and when you, look at, when you look at more easily um, checkable figures or easily... Um, uh, you know, things like websites and page views, you do see some really big numbers. But what's not known and what we're focusing on is why does it work and when does it work? Because it, it is not always working. So we're doing a bunch of, um, I guess, the um, there's two sides to it. There's the very academic side. We're doing uh, very detailed systematic reviews. We're looking at all the evidence that exists and trying to work out, well, when we look at everything at once, what actually is consistently showing up as working and what is not. We're doing that in a few different domains. Um, we're also working with our industry partners to sort of apply different models. We're running a randomised controlled trial now comparing a gamified mindfulness site to a non-gamified mindfulness site to try and isolate what's going to work and what's not. Um, and we're trying to work closely with our industry partners to really understand their users and context, which is a point that I'll come back to. But, as I've alluded to, I think the, um, the main thing about gamification is that many elements are not new. Um, and so we've been working as of others to try and work out, well, we're not reinventing the wheel. What do we already know that we can apply to sort of strengthen the use of gamification? And we ended up um, in, anyone who knows me is bored of hearing me talk about self-determination theory, but I talk about it a lot because it's such a powerful theory of motivation. And the basic idea behind this theory of motivation is that when we're intrinsically motivated to do almost anything, it, it almost invariably taps into all three or some of all three of these needs. So we have as humans a need to feel competent at what we're doing. We like knowing that we're doing well at it. Um, we respond really well to a sense of freedom of choice and, and autonomy. Um, and, and a sense of relatedness and connecting to other people is also really important. So anything, this, this, this theory has been applied really successfully in education, um, in sports psychology, um, in, in business places, um, hospitals, it, it, appears, it pops up everywhere. Um, and so what we've been playing with and, and others have too is, well, if we take this incredibly powerful theory of motivation and we look back at gamification, do we get clues as to what's working and what's not? And I think we, we not only do we get that, but then we can think about how to usefully apply these elements of gamification. So the sort of thing that we're, we're working with people on is if you're going to use badges, points, leaderboards and progress, make sure they really are conveying a clear sense of competence to the user. Um, build in autonomy through things like story and reflection and play. And make sure your leaderboards, where possible, you know, create a sense of relatedness, as does the story and play. And you can, you can keep working with these sort of things but, but if you use those guiding principles when you're looking at both the basic and the complex forms of gamification, you're going to get a far more successful um, result. And I spoke to Mike at Morning Tea, thank you for the permission to do this. There was an excellent example of just this this morning um, in, the, in the keynote where you see um, the, you know, there's, there's autonomy built in on the right. And this, I didn't see this slide before you did, so it's very fortuitous that it all happened in this way. But you've got autonomy built in and that I can skip this section. Um, you, you're getting a sense of competence. You're communicating the progress the person's making. Um, and I'll come back to the fact that there's really key informational and not controlling rewards being built, built in. So in terms of your successful application of gamification or, or how to approach this problem, the first thing we would suggest is you think carefully about whether it's um, what you're actually trying to achieve. Are you looking to motivate your employees to do something? Are you trying to engage clients with a particular aspect of your products or services? 
you need to know that before you think about whether gamification is the right tool and how you would apply that gamification. Do you want to change behaviour or an attitude? Uh, is, it, is the issue you're facing a lack of motivation or is it ease of use or lack of interest? Um, these sort of questions really inform whether this particular way of thinking about motivation are appropriate. Consider, of course, short and long-term change, as I mentioned. Um, and then these sort of things come out of, you know, I'm part of the CHI discipline here at QUT, and these sort of things are techniques we've been applying with how people engage with technology a long time, but they, they're still relevant now. So you, you want to adapt what you're building to your target domain. Of course, the same sort of tone or the same um, aspects of gamification are not going to work in each setting. Um, you really need to understand your target audience and consider things like level of expertise. So there's some not so surprising research in the end showing that um, with an exercise and fitness um, tool for, with gamification, the really expert users found the gamification got in the way, they found it condescending and annoying. The inexpert users were really engaged by it and found it really beneficial and it, and it motivated them a great deal. But, but of course you've got to think about that audience before you deploy this sort of thing. And as I touched on, um, informational versus controlling rewards, um, and I'll skip back, which you shouldn't do, but, but I was really struck by how the um, Brain HQ tool is telling you why that badge is useful to you. And so for, it explains why you'd want to do that activity and what its benefit is. So it's not as simple as, and you see it time and time again, it's not as simple as putting a badge on it and saying, do this five times out of 10 today, or do this six times this week. You need to communicate to the user why that's a valuable activity. And that's the difference between an informational and a controlling reward. Um, and the other thing that does is it stops you moving the locus of control. So you don't want to move the locus of control externally so that the user feels like they're doing it for reasons other than their own. You want to keep that internal and keep that motivation through all the things I've talked about intrinsic. Um, I might have even left time for questions. I'll find out from Danielle. <laughs>